So we will continue with uh, Joanna Fikes, um, who is the head of exhibitions department at the Pauline Museum. Uh, we've been privileged to listen to previous presentations on the Pauline Museum. Uh, it's a very inspiring new uh, museum uh, in Warsaw. So Joanna Fikus is a graduate of the Department of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at the Institute of History um, in the University of Warsaw. She's specialized in collecting and preparing using oral history methods, interviewing uh, with Polish Jews in particular, um, and with a, an emphasis on the pre-war period. She also completed her uh, postgraduate studies in the field of cultural diplomacy at Collegium Civitas in Warsaw. After working in the field of feature and documentary film production from 2002 onwards, she contributed to the Centropa project, conducting research on the history of European Jews in the 20th century, with particular emphasis on the experience of the Holocaust. And since 2007, she's been associated with the Poland Museum, first heading the team of 200 international specialists that prepared the core exhibition of the museum, and since 2015, working as the head of exhibitions department. She is a member of the board and chairperson of the grant committee of the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland. Uh, and her talk today is titled, titled In the Beginning, There Was a Dream. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your patience. It's quite late. Thank you, of course, the foundation for inviting me and having the opportunity to share with you uh, experience um, of Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw in Poland. So as the title uh, of my presentation, presentation tells you, in the beginning there was a dream. And I can really very precisely told you where, uh, when the dream appeared. It was when the Holocaust Museum in Washington was open, which was at the end of last century. A group of my colleagues from Jewish Historical Institute Association, it's the Jewish NGO in Poland, they went to Washington and they were absolutely thrilled. And then they came back and they said, well, we'd like to have something like this in Poland. Having said something like this is not very precise, so uh, very soon we understood that we have to be more focused. First of all, we decided that we don't want to create the museum about the Holocaust only, but about 1,000 years of the history of Polish Jews. One of the other objectives was that it will be a narrative museum. I don't have to explain to you what, what is narrative museum. Uh, but then the uh, other question that appeared was where? Uh, the, 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 the photo that you see uh, is, in front, is in fact very meaningful. Uh, in front of the photo you see the back side of the monument of Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This is the site which usually is not seen. All official delegations are going from the other side. It's the monument which was unveiled in 1948 and it depicts heroic figures of Warsaw Ghetto fighters. Here on the back side, you can see the civilians. And the building that you see behind, that's the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Um, the architectural contest, international architectural contest that we announced gathered a group of star architects uh, like Daniel Libeskin and Eisenman and so on and completely unknown architect from Finland, Rainer Mahlamaki, he won the contest. Why? Because one of the objectives was to create a dialogue between the monument and the building. Uh, the monument has a very, in fact, very simple facade with these dramatic figures that I've mentioned. Uh, and it's the same like the building. The building, in fact, it's like a glass box with this gap that you see here. I don't have the pointer, but you see the gap. The gap is the entrance. And uh, the symbolism that architect told us, he said, it's like the Red Sea split in front of Moses, who was leading Jews from Egypt. You know, with, interpret with interpretation, it's like with art. You can have your own. Uh, but what I think is also interesting was why we wanted to create this museum. Here I'm simply reminding the mission of the museum, and let me read it out loud, to recall and preserve the memory of the history of Polish Jews. And that could be the full stop here. 
But the other part of the sentence is really important for us. By contributing to the mutual understanding and respect amongst Poles and Jews as well as other societies of Europe and the world. And that's really, really crucial for our activities because uh, we can't change the past. But, oops, but uh, learning from the past, we can change the present and the future. And that's, that's I would say, uh, quite an obvious task for us. But what was important for us, uh, the site specificity. We are a very, I would say, unique museum if we wanted to be compared somehow at the beginning to Holocaust Museum in Washington or even maybe Yad Vashem. Uh, we are created in the site where the history that we are talking happened. We are standing in the middle of pre-war Jewish district. We are standing in the middle of Warsaw Ghetto. So this was important for us to somehow bring back the information about the memory, about the space where we are to our visitors. Let me show you how this space looked like once the war was over. I'm talking about the year 1945. The ghetto was changed into the complete sea of ruins. Here you can see the sign, street sign, uh, which uh, read, writes uh, Anielewicz Street and the uh, hero of ghetto street. There was nothing there. And uh, you, please, you, you please remember that once the war was over, 90% of its Jewish inhabitants of this area were murdered and killed. Uh, many of those who survived did not want to live on the cemetery. So the question for uh, governance, for municipality of the city is how to rebuild this area and for whom? And also the other question is how to commemorate those who perished. Uh, the place that the, the photo that you see depicts a uh, few survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto who are standing on the very first monument, which, which is now in, exactly in front of our uh, museum. It's a very small uh, monument in the shape of the, in the, shape of the, of the sewer. The building you see behind. That's exactly the place where now the museum is built. I was talking about site specificity, how to convey, how to show your visitors that you are really in the space where history happened, where in fact, all material heritage is almost uh, destroyed. So what we did, uh, you can see here this very, very small dot in the middle of the wall, that's now the close-up to this dot. At the entrance to each Jewish uh, home, you have mezuzah. Mezuzah where you have a scroll of the uh, first words of prayer, Shema Israel. So what we did, we made an excavation on the non-existing street and we found few bricks from non-existing buildings which were standing on non-existing street. And from this, br from this, from this bridge we made mezuzah, uh, which is in carriage, which, is, uh, mm, which seems to uh, hide the first uh, words of Shema Israel. Uh, what you see now is the part of the core exhibition. This is the uh, gallery which is talking about interwar year. It's a very spectacular multimedia installation which shows you a street in the pre-war Jewish town. But people who are entering it, they say, wow, great, but they have absolutely no feeling of authenticity. Even though the exact path of this street, this artificial street, is the same as pre-war street. And you know what our educators are doing with small children? They are asking them to, down, to be down on their knees and to touch the pavement. And they are saying, hey, you know, this is like the pavement looked like before the war. But this is all what we can offer, talking about authenticity. The same story is about another part of my museum, that's so-called Aryan Street, uh, which we are describing in the pre-war Jewish district, in the, in the gallery uh, of Ghetto. That's the same, trying effort to recreate something. But people still saying we are still missing authenticity. And I have to say that we did a lot of survey on our visitors and asking for remarks about our exhibition. And one of the very first remarks, they said, 
we are lacking original objects. And I have to say that it took me two years to understand what they are talking about. We thought, oh, probably they are missing art, like painting, original paintings or something. No, they were missing feeling of authenticity. One of the guys said, listen, I would give everything to have a chair of a guy who was studying Torah in yeshiva just to, just to be able to touch it. So what we did, we understood that we have to we have to embrace this uh, desire. The, the exhibition that we are planning in 2020 will be the first which will be really, really devoted to the place where the museum is located. Uh, that's the place that it will be the story of this area, which is called Muranov. The area is called Muranov, which was in fact inhabited by Jews at the end of eight, in 19th century. Uh, we would like to tell the story for our neighbors from Muranov. But you know, it's very hard sometimes to live in the place where everybody is reminding you, hey, do you know what a tragedy happened here? Do you know? Do you understand? I can imagine that for these people who are living there for 70 years or maybe less, they have their own history. They want this uh, space to have also their, to tell, they, they want to be able to tell their own history. So the exhibition that we are planning will be like layers, like palimpsest. We want to say, listen, the whole history of this place, past of this place is below the ground level, but the presence and the future is above. And we will tell you this story not in chronological order, but in the order of these layers. I'm really sorry, I don't have, I couldn't find the one wonderful drawing. When museum was being built, there was architecture, uh, archaeological excavation. And there was the excavation which unveiled layers of bricks, ground, and everything what happened, um, uh, what is below the uh, museum. So what we want to say, we also found a lot of original objects. We want to bring back these original objects into its uh, natural context. For example, we find the scissors. Do you see these scissors? And one of artists, a very wonderful Polish uh, contemporary artist, he's taking them, he's bringing them into the contemporary context. For example, he brought it to the Taylor workshop. And he's doing photos, and photos will be shown not only in the museum, in the exhibition, but he will make installations around the whole neighborhood showing where this workshop could be. So I think this is one of the um, way of bringing back this authenticity. Um, what also I would like to say is um, sometimes it's really... Um, hard to uh, encourage, we were talking about participation of people who are living in the, in the neighborhood. Or it's sometimes r quite hard to encourage them to be a part, real part of the process of creating the exhibition. And here we want them to, in we want to invite them and say, okay, bring your own memories, bring objects that you would like to be meaningful for visitors. I think it's really important uh, to um, try to encourage people, encourage your possible audience, that's what we were also talking about, to come to your institution and to tell them, uh, and I'm talking in the context of our museum, it is not only about tragic events. It is not only about it. We are encouraging you to come. We are encouraging you to know, to experience, to feel empathy. Because as I said, we are not only focused on, fo on Holocaust, but also on the whole 1,000 years. And one of the examples that I like to show you is our Daffodils campaign. That's the campaign which we are doing all around Warsaw uh, every 19th April, because that's the day of of the um, uh, first day of uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising from 1943. And we are bringing uh, uh, badges which are looking like a yellow daffodil. Why yellow daffodil? 
because uh, one of the few remaining members of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Marek Edelman, every year he was going to the monument and he was putting yellow daffodils to commemorate those who perished. So suddenly, a few years ago, we wanted to bring back people the uh, story of this uh, uprising and we had a group of volunteers, which now spread to 2,000 volunteers, and every year we are giving approximately 150,000 daffodils, trying people at least to feel the, um, to express their empathy. Uh, so that's one of, one of the way how we are doing it, and at the end of my presentation I'd like to show you a very short three-minute film about general what we are doing in the museum. I'm trying to, I will try to do it, which is not so easy. One second. Mm -hmm. This is an overwhelming exhibit. It really is a commentary on our time. Thank you very much.